everybody. My name is Wayne McDonald. I'm the Chief FX Market Strategist for TradersWay.com. Today is Monday, the 2nd of February, 2015. Let's plan out our trading week. Let's go through the calendar, look at the event risks ahead of us, and let's go through the commitment of traders report to look for large speculative um, positions in the marketplace. Another way of saying it is let's track down the smart money and get them. As always, I should say trading, investing, anything with leverage is extremely risky, not appropriate for everyone, so never risk money you cannot afford to lose. No matter what, good or bad, past performance does not predict future results, so stay small and stay humble. We care about you. We want you to succeed and trade for many years to come successfully. Best way to do that is to be conservative and disciplined. Focus on the long term. All right. Let's start with the commitment to traders report. As I was saying, these are basically hedge fund positions. You have to be, uh, your position in the markets have to be large enough that you hit the requirement that the government has for you to report these positions so that they know how lopsided the market might be. Let's see, hmm, if everyone was short the Swiss franc, nobody was long, what happens if that market collapses? Well, you don't have a market. <laughs> so I guess what, this government's supposed to step in and do something? I don't know. But anyway, so it's a requirement. If you uh, are a large trader and have large positions, you are required to report it. Also, if you're in the marketplace as a participant that is hedging, you are required to define yourself as a hedging market participant. So these are non-hedging positions. They're speculative. They're there to make money. Hey, that's kind of like you and me. Except we're small, we don't have to report. So you could take all you know all this information, you could extrapolate who's who in the marketplace. So I'm just, you know, since they're non-hedging, guess what? That means they're hedge funds. <laughs> I know, it's stupid. But that's that's what that's who it is. Okay. So we're going to go through the um, various currency pairs here and find out what the large players are doing in the market. And these are the large players that are putting positions in the market simply to make money. Sounds like friends of mine, huh? Okay. So this is Euro. Non-hedging, open FX positions in Euro, priced in dollars, so Euro-dollar. These... These uh, positions were reported to the government on Tuesday of last week. The government released this data on Friday at the close of the market. So this is Monday morning. This is a good time to go through it. It's as recent as we can possibly get it. Now, one thing you can see here, this red line represents the prices. Okay, that's Euro USD, right? Euro priced in dollars. <clears throat> we're way down here. This is as of Tuesday, right? Now, one thing that we're looking at is week over week, price drops significantly. We know it drops even more significantly, right? But anyways, here we are, buck 12, right? So it's not far off from where we are now, right? But the change over week, there was a drastic change in price. Okay, fine. Now, what about the change in net positions? Okay, so these, this is kind of the, the net positions, right? So how about the change here from week to week? Was there a dramatic change like there was in price? What do you think, guys? How would you describe it? No. So let's figure out what's going on, right? Very little change in net. Okay, net. 
Was there a change in long positions? Moderate. Moderate. So price changed, but not the positions. So it seems to me it's dollar based. Switch over to pig. Okay. So no real change in the marketplace. Maybe do we need do we change our sentiment? If there was no change, if there was no significant change in bullish positions or bearish positions, should you change your fundamental bias? Well, that's up to you to figure out. <laughs> Probably not, right? Come on now, right? All right, this is the pig, the great British pound. Okay, what's going on here? Very little change in price. Very little change in net positions. Few people tried to go long. Few people tried to go short. Nothing. But we know it does change, right? Maybe not of Tuesday, but I think of Wednesday last week. We know that a couple of the uh, voting members of the Bank of England have become a little less hawkish. So we'll find out next week. Okay, just the timing is just off. It's too bad we didn't squeeze that information in there. But as of Tuesday of last week, no big change. Again, should you change your fundamental bias? If you've been a bear, as price has been falling and falling and net positions have been falling and falling from, from bullish to less bullish to neutral to bearish, should you change your fundamental bias based on what the smart money is doing? No, no change. Okay, Japanese yen. Does anybody care about trading the Japanese yen? Si, senor. I like to trade the yen, I think. Right? <clears throat> All right. What's going on? Net positions. Whoa. Whoa, three weeks in a row. Well, I guess two weeks in a row. A significant change. Okay, this orange line here shows there's a drastic change. Less people short. Huh. Whale oil bee, MR fish, huh? Less people short and a few, well, well, price went up a little bit. Okay, and then this gray area. Gray is long. All right, are there more people buying Japanese yen? Is the, okay, the market is definitely less bearish than it used to be. Okay, does that mean, based on this data, is the market buying Japanese yen, yes or no? <clears throat> now, isn't this incredibly helpful information? USD yen has been falling for several weeks now. The net position is significantly less bearish, but check this out. Nobody's buying it. So how could the market be less bearish if, if there's no bulls? If there's no bulls, how could it be less bearish? That's where you, you could call it, let's say, profit taking. So we're checking out this line here. Let me outline it in blue. Okay. This is short positions. Okay. Orange line is short positions. These are all the open positions that are short Japanese yen. Okay. Which means they would be long USD Japanese yen, right? When this orange line goes up, USD yen should go up. Okay, and look what's happening here. Less and less. Okay, the peak, Thanksgiving. Okay, you can see about the third week of November. 
Interesting, right? So lots of profit taking, but nobody's buying the Japanese yen. Well, let's see. Almost nobody's changed their long positions in three weeks. And over the course of you know that time at Thanksgiving, there's less and less people buying Japanese yen. All right? So right now it's just bears getting out, waiting for um, waiting. Now, I, I think it's kind of interesting because they're speculative, right, positions. But um, this time of year, you can get some Japanese yen seasonality based on um, um, fiscal year end flows. It's very interesting. So wouldn't it be nice, though, to see um, the short positions rise significantly? If you had a couple of weeks where, you know, the dots kind of are falling like they are now, and all of a sudden you have a big dot jump and then another big dot jump showing that there's more and more people short. Should you perhaps go from neutral to, let's say, more aggressively long USD Japanese yen? What do you think, guys? What would you justify to your investors? Let's say you have a managed Forex program and you have clients. You could say, well, you know, I've been watching the large reportable speculative, speculative positions taken by um, hedge funds and other large institutional speculative investors in the marketplace as reported to the Commodities Futures and Trading Commission. And it shows that they're aggressively shorting the Japanese yen, so we're riding the wave along with them. And they're going to carry us. I hope you don't mind. What do you think of that? Does that sound like degenerate gambling? Or does it seem fairly logical and part of a strategy? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you're welcome. <laughs> You can go to father-in-law. It's all good. You'll earn the money back. All right. So, anyways, cool. Good information. Right? Isn't it nice that we can take a glance at this? Okay. So we're not quite ready to aggressively short the Japanese yen, but I would still look for key psych levels. Okay, I would still buy at support if I had the opportunity and the right market conditions, right? If things were favorable. Okay, Swiss franc. I'm still so mad at the Swiss National Bank, I don't even want to look at it. I'm sorry. Oh, it just drives me nuts. Yeah, I just can't believe it. I've never heard of it in the history of central banking policy. In fact, if you go back over the last 100 years and looked at modern central banking policy and uh, strategy and how they've become more and more transparent over, over these decades from a central bank not telling you anything what's going on, to then, let's say, I don't know, Volcker years, you know, little, still very opaque. And then you get to sort of Greenspan years, and you'd sit around for weeks debating on about what he just said. You'd, you'd talk for two hours, and then we'd have three weeks worth of debate on what he said and what it all meant. Then Bernanke comes along, makes a lot of changes, and says, let's just speak as frankly as possible. Let's tell the market what we're thinking, how we feel, and, you know, and be as transparent as possible so that the market has time to adjust and position themselves. In fact, let's speed up the, um, you know, let's release our meeting minutes faster. Let's do press conferences more often. Let's speak as frankly as possible. 
I mean, this is modern central banking policy. Let's tell people our inflation targets. Let's just tell people what we want to do. So for a central bank to come out and say on Tuesday that the floor of 120 is still the core central policy of the Swiss National Bank and on Thursday bankrupt people and institutions globally is just unthinkable. No, Sharon, Sharon says they want to destroy the industry. No, look, it was a flawed policy that kind of made sense two or three years ago. Then, then because central banks are slow as molasses, they should have dropped it, the, the floor long ago. Because everybody knew, because I could discuss it for months and months and months before it happened, that the euro was going to come down like a ton of bricks. Absolutely simple to foresee. And 140, finally it starts coming down. That's when the Swiss national banks should have just said, you know what, we're out. So now, because they didn't act, they get to this situation. The Swiss national bank is there defending a floor and... The, the European Central Bank, which is many times larger than the Swiss National Bank, you know, they're going to issue quantitative easing, which just completely destroys the Swiss National Bank's capability of defending that floor in the first place. Okay, so getting rid of it isn't complicated. That's what should have happened. It could have happened that week. That would have been fine, or the week before, or the month before or even a couple of months before, they could have dropped it. And it was the right decision. What I find dumbfounding is not only did they not hint at it or and give us time to readjust our portfolios, because that's what institutional investors need, is time to rebalance. Instead of hinting that it was coming, to hinting that we were worried about it, the Swiss National Bank was worried about it, that they're going to have trouble de defending, and that if the ECB decides to do quantitative easing, this could be this and that could be that. None of that happened. They did say things like, hey, if Greece gets kicked out of the Eurozone, we're going to readjust our floor from 120 to 115. Okay, 500 pips. 500 pips. When the floor was dropped, the market dropped 4,000 pips in five minutes. I mean, the scale of it is just incredible. But if they hinted at it like, hey, we kind of feel like maybe the Eurozone's falling apart and blah, blah, but no, no. So we fast forward. Like 36 hours before they dropped the floor, they told the world, stick with us. Stay with the pig. It's the core theme of our policy, and that is not going to change. So, should an institutional investor change in their policy and rebalance their portfolio? No, they were thinking about it. They were worried about it. It was a risk, but then the Swiss National Bank came out and said, don't worry about it. It's okay. It's going to be all right. We're going to defend. Oh, well, in that case, good. <laughs> Boom! Slaughtered us. Oh, that's the part that drives me nuts. If they would have even hinted 36 hours earlier, or a week earlier, or a month earlier, a couple of months earlier, the market would have thinned out their positions and normalized what, and, and avoided uh, destroying institutions and even countries. I think the Polish Zlaty lost 40% in one day. I mean, come on, right? So anyways, I don't know how you get me over on these things, but I, I don't want to even look at that Swiss franc. That's the part that bothers me, though, okay? It's counterintuitive to all modern central banking policy over a hundred years of development and, you know, stepping on the border of negligence and even, you know, 
ethical responsibility or something. I mean, my gosh. All right. Okay. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy. Oi, oi, oi. Small net change to the downside. We have a two-week trend to the down. Okay. Gray is long positions. Orange is short positions. Okay, slightly more people went short. Slightly more people went long. Just, I would say, almost a neutral scenario here. But we know what it is, isn't it? Bad fundamentals. Bad economics. Bad, I mean, negative. Not, not like someone's doing something bad. But the, the, the outlook for commodities is bearish. The, the, you know, all this, that, or the other thing. But somewhere in there, we had a surprising um, Chinese GDP. So a few more people went long um, than probably what was necessary. Because if you can look at the long positions over the last several weeks, right? Right? Less people long, dramatically less people long, less people long, less people long, more people long? But more people short. Right? So... It's like, uh, so here's what it looks like to me, you know, price-wise, I would consider it almost like a pullback, and then I would short the rally if I were me. That's how I read that. That I'm, a, that I'm still bearish, that a, a couple of monkey heads went long when they shouldn't have. Okay? <clears throat> Which means when they decide they've made a mistake, it's going to come down, isn't it? When they realize, oops, I should have bought. Good. That's how we make money. <clears throat> Kiwi. Okay. Fall in price. Fall in net positions. Volume increased significantly, but just more bears. There's more bulls and more bears this week, but just more bears than bulls were added. So we're still kind of, you know, we're this is the one that's floating near the water line, so we're still kind of neutral. But the bears are starting to win. Okay? The bears are starting to win. So fundamentally... Um, this is still bearish. Risk is to the downside. This still suggests, you know, um, short. <clears throat> but I think if the yens weaken and we get a change in, in fundamentals, Kiwi still might be the first one to go along on, on a Kiwi yen, for example. Okay. Very interesting. Dramatic increase in price. Okay. You know, and not not a huge change in positions. Seems to be a lot of dollar play in there, huh? <clears throat> U.S. dollar quite strong comparatively. Okay? Got a request for gold. Uh, this is just for uh, FX positions. I don't have gold on this. Sorry. Okay, let's go through the calendar for the week. Okay, PCE, yeah, I, I tend to like PCE certainly even better than GDP because it's so backward looking, um, maybe better than CPI, expenditure, you know, it's money. Okay, let me just change the filter if I if I may. 
three stars only. Okay, ISM manufacturing. You know, the reason why ma manufacturing is an interesting one um, in an unhealthy market is that when, when a central bank is going through a process like quantitative easing, it takes time to get money into the, into the economy, doesn't it? So the economy, uh, the, um, the central bank prints money. Do they, okay, and, and what do they do with the money? Let's, let's do this quickly. Central bank prints money. What do they do with the money in, in the process of quantitative easing? Come on, guys, type, 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 type. I don't want to make a 30-minute a speech on this. Come on. No, they print it. What do they do with it? Increase it. You're not answering it. What do they do with the money when they print it? No, they don't distribute it. What do they do? With, what do they physically do? It buy bonds. Okay. Do they buy bond? They buy government bonds, right? They don't buy corporate bonds, right? Okay, good. So, what do they do? Do they go to the government and buy government bonds? Do they walk over to the treasury and say, "Hey, treasury, sell us some government bonds"? The answer to that is no. Because if they did that, money would go to the government. That doesn't do anything. So they call up Goldman Sachs. Hey, Goldman Sachs, we want to buy a bunch of treasuries. Would you go to the treasury, buy the treasuries from the government, and then sell it to us at a profit? Goldman's like, yeah. How many do you need? Oh, how about 80 billion? Yeah, sure. We'll sell you... We'll go ahead and buy $60 billion worth of bonds from the Treasury. We'll sell them to you for 80. How does that sound? They're like, yeah, we're in. Sounds good. Make it happen. Engage. Right? Isn't that crazy? So anyway, so they call up the banks and they buy a bunch of Treasuries. Okay? Yeah, I wish I was Goldman Sachs, right? I'd take that order any day, right? So anyways, um, that's how the money enters the system. So, long story short, you need to make a bunch of bankers filthy, stinking rich. They go out and buy yachts and palaces and apartments high in the sky. And that money then goes to, you know, the, the real estate brokers and, people, and the salespeople. And, and, then, uh, and then they fix up the houses and, and hire decorators and... So, you know, decorators are getting money. The furniture people are getting money. And it starts trickling down, right? They go to the Mercedes dealership and they buy themselves a Maybach, and, you know, and the money goes there. And then so suddenly Mercedes has less cars. And so now they got to call the factory. And they're like, hey, man, we need more cars. And so they need to fire up the factories and retool the equipment and hire more workers and so on and so forth. Um, and it trickles down. Eventually, the the guy that you know, um, the guy that fastens bolts to nuts at the factory goes home and buys more groceries, and um, I don't know, maybe makes enough money where he pays a gardener and you know someone to mow his lawn for him, and then the money goes into the guy that mows his lawn and you know, works 19 hours a day for below minimum wage with no benefits, and no health care, you know, no car insurance. But eventually it trickles all the way down. Now, do you think that process happens quickly? No. Okay. Right? But it, but it happens. So, you know, that's why I kind of like looking at, um, you know, like ISM manufacturing um, you know, when credit was made available for the first time in the United States during the crash, I mean, I bought a, you know, I bought a, a Mercedes 
I bought an AMG 55 for unbelievably cheap because I was the only person in, in the Atlanta area that had cash. And people were trying to buy this car and the dealer was trying to dump it. But like seven people tried to buy it and they're like, okay, well, you know, I don't have 80,000 in cash. So they, they went to the bank and the bank's like, there's no market. There's no credit. We don't know anything going on. There's nothing. We can't loan you any money because we can't borrow the money. We don't know how to, we don't know how to price the risk. We can't do anything. Right? So there was a time in the world when there was no credit. So I bought it for pennies on the dollar. Thank you very much. Cause I had cash. So the market broke down. Okay. You couldn't get a loan even if you were triple a credit rating. So when the market started to come back, one of the first things that happened after a couple of years of the market not functioning properly, um, things like car sales start to improve, right? Durable goods. And durable goods are because the big expensive purchases that are going to require credit. Oh, I, I think I paid, no joke, like 27000 bucks or something. I can't remember. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. The guy was laughing. He's like, dude, this is sick. <laughs> yeah, AMG 55, top drop down. Pfft. Yeah, nice car. Hoo-ha. <laughs> Anyways, hey, not my problem. I saved him. The guy was desperate. He needed the money, and I had cash. All right, so anyways. Um, so credit becomes available. Durable goods start increasing, right? And so what happens before maybe, you know, what happens uh, when durable good orders start increasing? They're buying fridges and stuff. And maybe you can include autos in there like planes and stuff. But let's call them, let's call them cars, like more typical, right, things. Um, credit becomes available and people start buying bigger ticket items and drawing down the inventory. So these manufacturers during the, you know, let's say the boom times, Fill, you know, had the factories moving at full capacity, so we want to look at uh, capacity uh, utilization, right? Industrial capacity and utilization. So that when the times are good, the factories are working at full bore, and then suddenly things collapse very quickly. They make all their widgets and gadgets, lay everybody off, and then the widgets and gadgets stay in inventory, right? So we want to see, uh, so you'll see a drop in. Um, um, Factory capacity and utilization, that drops, and inventories rise, sales drop, prices start dropping because they're trying to liquidate things, right? Fine. So as economists, we want to see things come back the other way. C capacity utilization in industrial production, that's not going to pick up first, right? Right? Why would that pick up first? They're, warehouses are full of inventory. So we want to see the drawdown in inventories first, right? Then what? So think of this now. Think of the Mer uh, the Mercedes or how about Ford? Right? Let's pick on Ford now. How about Ford dealerships when there was no credit available and they had a thousand cars on the lot, maybe two thousand cars on the lot, right? The guy's sitting on twenty million dollars worth of inventory, but there's not even credit, and the the economy's collapsing. People are losing their jobs. Are people walking on the lot saying, "Hey, man, I'd like to pay cash for a Ford"? right? Just not going to happen, right? So we start tracking, as economists now, we start tracking th these changes and trends. And, um, you know, so suddenly a guy gets half decent job again. And, and I don't know, I don't think he's going to get a wage increase, but, it, you know, still feels comfortable with the economy and, and the credit markets start to open up and he can borrow money now to buy a car, durable goods goes up, uh, retail sales go up. And eventually, we see a drawdown in inventories. What happens when the Ford dealer says, "Man, we only have we have half of an inventory, and tr you know, traffic as far as customers showing up is uh, starting to improve." Well, you got to hire a few more salespeople, place a few more ads, right? And then what? Call up the factory. We need more Ford. Right? Manufacturing jobs start picking up. 
and, and you know, and, and we're tracking the money. This is what we're doing, guys. We're tracking the money. And so that's why uh, normally in a, in, a, in a fully recovered, fully functioning, healthy U.S. economy, I don't really care about manufacturing jobs that much because there are very, uh, you know, America is more of a service in, uh, economy than a manufacturing economy. But when I'm following the dollars from quantitative easing, I want to see manufacturing jobs because I want to see retail sales up. I want to see consumer confidence up. I want to see inventories down. I want to see manufacturing, industrial production, capacity utilization stats, so on and so forth, because I want to see the money trickle down. Right? And so now, let's do this now for Europe. This is your opportunity now to think like an economist. Quantitative easing has been announced. Good, let's start tracking the money. How long is it going to take for the bank, uh, you know, the European Central Bank to print the money, buy the bonds, get it to the banks, get the capital markets flowing, get money distributed from the banks to um, to loans, right, which means you need a credit system. Loans to who? Individuals? Who else takes out loans? Small businesses, right? And they start maybe hiring and, and, and retooling and all that kind of stuff, and things start to slowly happen. So at, at a bare minimum, six months to a year, I, I think in a full cycle, though, you know, it took the United States quantitative easing, QE2, QE3. I think the ECB should just come out and say, QE infinity, this is going to be a three-year trip. Which, no joke, it could be, it could be a five-year stretch for Europe. Minimum. Because we got it. This, sink, this ship is sinking. You ever tried to raise a sinking ship half full of water? It's a little difficult, right? It's going to take a lot of work. Spain has what, 30% unemployment? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be tough. But what do we do right off the bat? Quantitative easing, boom, free money, rally, start buying as many stocks as possible, right? Simple, easy. Fish jumping into the boat. And then what? Then we start tracking the money. When does credit start becoming available? When are loans being made? When are the capital markets available for uh, companies to issue new stock and bonds in the primary market? So on and so forth, right? Start watching inventories. When, when is consumer confidence going to improve? When are jobs going to improve? When is spending going to improve? When are they going to draw down the inventories? When the inventories draw down, when do new orders come for durable goods? Right? Once those inventories draw down, when does industrial um, uh, production and capacity utilization figures start improving? How about manufacturing data, ISM manufacturing data? How about PPI? When do we start to see inflation in PPI? and commodities like iron ore and coal and copper? When does energy start stabilizing because factories need electricity? Right? And then, you know, and all of a sudden you see the money trickling around the economy because now, you know, widgets and gadgets need to be shipped. So shipping companies, both internationally as far as supply chain management, but also like, you know, last haul, last mile delivery guys and you know, and then those, and then those lead to jobs, and those leads to jobs, and those leads to jobs, and right, and pretty soon you got your your gardener is making money too, not just the banker, but the gardener pushing the mower. Very quick story here. Back in the dot com days, uh, when I lived in the Silicon Valley doing my entrepreneurial stuff, there was a funny story about uh, some guy he made a, you know, some young kid made his millions on some stupid company that went public, right? So he's showing off his money and he bought like a beautiful house in Los Altos Hills. He's fixing it up and he's just throwing money at it like crazy, right? 
just millions out of whatever. It doesn't matter. It's all free money. Boom, boom, boom. Pr any, you know, price is no object. So finally, you know, he has all these workers over there, and um, they're working. And finally, he goes up to the landscaper, and he says, hey, every year I throw a 4th of July party, and it's awesome. And this, this, the landscape at this house I just bought is a complete disaster. So, you know, um, you know, make it awesome. Do whatever you need to do. The guy's like, no, that, you know, that's six months away. There's no way that's going to happen. I'm too busy. There's no way that I can get your house ready for this party in only six months. And the kid looks at him and says, I'll tell you what. If you can get this place set up for my 4th of July party, I will give you a $1 million cash bonus. Landscaper leans in, looks at the guy, says, you know what? I don't need your money. I'm too busy. <laughs> and he turned the million dollar cash bonus down because he didn't need the money. Now, there is a prime economy at that point when the guy that mows your lawn doesn't need the million dollars. Okay? Are we there right now? Probably not. But we need to track the money from the top of the economy to the bottom of the economy, right? And so we're about halfway through that process in the United States. And we're just beginning that process in the Eurozone. Um, let's track it. Make, it a, make an education of it. Was that helpful as far as putting all this stuff together? Like, what does it mean? Oh, ISM manufacturing, then we get some trade balance, and, you know, <laughs> purchasing managers and stuff like that. You know, what does it all mean? What does it all mean, Basil? Follow the money, my friend. That's all it is. Farther down the, the money has trickled, the more likely that currency is probably strong. So if, if I were me, I'd be buying European equities and I would be shorting the euro until uh, quantitative easing ends. And then I'd probably buy the euro. But that ain't this week, okay? So there's my plan. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, I, I. All right, so anyways, manufacturing. Um, yeah, services are more important, but right now I'm tracking the money. I'd like to see some good numbers in the manufacturing industry because I, I, I want to see the trickle down. Justin, yeah, Trader's Way, fantastic binary option platform that allows you to manage your binary positions within your MT4 account. Just beautiful. Trader's Way is the way to go with Trader Wayne. Okay, so anyways, let's track the money there, ISM. Boy, see, I wanted to get to the fundamentals, or I mean the technicals. So we're going to have to do technicals tomorrow, guys. Okay. Right? Going to have to do technicals tomorrow. Are you willing to log in tomorrow? We'll go through like four-hour charts and drill down and start doing like week, weekly swings and stuff. Will we be here tomorrow? Okay, awesome. Let's finish this though, okay? RBA interest rate decision, huge. Okay, so um, so tomorrow, you know, watch the the Asian session. The RBA interest RBA interest rate decision is a great one for scalping. Okay. Construction PMI out of the UK? Uh, not that interested. All right. Okay, Kiwi jobs. Sure, because you know we're we're kind of neutral on that on that one. Neutral to bearish. A good number out of there would be you know would stabilize the Kiwi and you know um, it, it's again worth a scalp if it's a really good number or a really bad number. The Kiwi's really going to move, but what we what we want to see is just sort of stable. Um, you know, Kiwi has lost a lot of value um, recently, so 
uh, a poor number here is really going to pull down the Kiwi some more. Okay? So watch that. I think more than anything, we want to see what Wheeler's thinking, right? PMI, okay, fine. You know, uh, you know, with this UK, with this UK stuff, we just want to see: is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? I mean, look, look at the UK stuff. I mean, it's going to be a lot of pound trading this week, right? Some PMI, it's just construction stuff, but whatever. Uh, some PMI data for the UK. Then PMI services later, right? Then the BOE interest rate decision, and then the, the, the statement, and so on and so forth. So there's going to be a lot of British pound this week uh, trading. Um, lots of RBA stuff, right? Lots of Aussie and Kiwi stuff. So the policy statement, retail sales, I'll throw the Wheeler stuff in there, Kiwi and, and Aussie, you know, the cousins, right? Um, the RBA stuff early in the week and some trade balance and I mean just, just going to be a lot of Aussie movement and a lot of pound movement. All right, let's just get that done. Fine. ADP, great opportunity to scalp. Very often it's a better scalping opportunity than even non-farm payrolls. IV PMI, that does move the CAD significantly. ISM services, another great one for, for trading U.S. dollar. Okay, again, typically in a healthy economy, ISM services is going to be better than IS, ISM manufacturing. And in fact, uh, many years ago, um, uh, where was I? I was in New York um, with, uh, what, Ashraf was there, and um, um, Todd Gordon, Ashraf Lottie, and myself, uh, we were at a, a panel speaking at uh, the, uh, the New York Traders Expo. And it was interesting at that time what I remember. I remember the, the situation, but we were also talking, the three of us, how interesting it was that ISM was moving the market more than non-farm payrolls. So obviously before the crash, right? I'm guessing 2007, 2006, something like that. In a, you know, in a, let's say even a beyond, in, in a very bullish, you know, fast-moving economy, ISM services was even more important than non-farm payrolls. Well, right now, I'm actually, as an economist, paying more attention to the manufacturing one. Sales, you know, services, fine, fine, fine. But I'm, I'm following the money, okay? So that's, you know, so right now, that, that'll, that'll hopefully change in the future where I care more about services. But I want to see sort of a, a bigger picture of the, of the overall economy, right? And what? Trade balance, fine. And then, of course, non farm payrolls. We go, right? CAD, CAD unemployment, CAD trade balance. So, um, I, so Wednesday, I would, I would start include, including uh, Kitty CAD, right? Because Wednesday, we have I, IV PMI, but what happens at 1030? Oil inventories by the Department of Energy. So you right. So every Wednesday you're trading CAD, anyways, right? You know to do that, right? So anyway, so you got CAD Wednesday, followed up by, you know, uh, trade balance Thursday, unemployment on Friday, lots of CAD. So lots of Aussie, lots of CAD, lots of dollar, um, and and lots of pound this week. So maybe it gives euro a breather. Who knows, right? So I'm sorry it took um, took so much of your time um, today. It's very your time's valuable. I understand. I'm sorry I got sidetracked, but maybe maybe it was a good thing. So uh, if you like these sessions, you like me helping out. Um, hey, first of all, you're welcome. Second of all, open up a live account with Traders Way and trade with them. We're hoping that uh, that I can help you become confident and successful so that you can trade profitably for many years to come. And think about it this way. Um, Trader's Way is, an invest, is investing resources into you right off the bat, up front, because they're trying to earn your loyalty. And they want you to be successful. So 
If you enjoy these events, you want them to continue happening daily for many weeks, many months to come, pay it back that way. Okay? I appreciate the thanks and the high fives and stuff. Open up the live account. That's the best way to track it. Okay? So peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May your profits be above average. I'll see you tomorrow. I promise you we'll do hardcore technical analysis. Okay, I'm sorry I didn't get to it today. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.